So the, the last subject I thought I had to cover was backups when your GPS isn't working for one reason or another. And if you watched other videos, you know I'm a big fan of chart plotters and I have two of them on this boat. Um, but you can't really rely on them. And we've had several situations, particularly on charter boats, where the chart plotter was, was non-functional. Um, in the Sea of Cortez, we had a working chart plotter, but according to the charts, we sailed through islands and we anchored on top of small mountains. Um, the charts were just way off. And um, I, I think the reason for that is whoever created those charts had started with probably British Admiralty charts, and those were done in the days of celestial navigation and before there were digital clocks. And so if the timepiece was off by 10 seconds, then, you know, they'd be off by a couple of miles. And that's okay if you're way, up, way away from land, but when you're coming into an anchorage, a couple of miles is enormous. And, um, yeah, it's hard to describe how disconcerting it is when there's an instrument you're used to relying on and it's just giving you bogus information. It, it's really better to just put the cover on the thing, shut it off, and use your paper charts and um, go from there. Another charter, we were up in uh, British Columbia in Desolation Sound, with this beautiful boat. The the GPS antenna had been mounted on the stern pulpit to get it away from the mast, which is great, except somebody had then built a bimini and they put two of the cross beams right over the GPS antenna. And if that wasn't enough, they didn't install a barbecue on top of that. So the GPS um, <laughs> never got a signal, not once. And Desolation Sound's an area where you really have to be on your toes with navigation because there's a lot of submerged rocks and there are large submerged reefs that are really right in the path you would take if you didn't know about them. Um, and so what I always do um, on this boat and on any charter is I always take paper charts along um, and you know I take the necessary equipment to, to um, follow angles across the chart. I, I prefer these to the parallel rulers. This. Um, these little rollers allow you to scoot across the chart. And then I, I bring along this pair of binoculars that have a built-in compass, which you can see as you're sighting an object. Um, and even in a pretty nasty swell, if you're patient um, and keep looking, you can get a, an angle to an object within a couple degrees. If it's calm, you can get it within one degree easily. Um, but it's a lot easier than those hand-bearing compasses to use the ones with the um, compass built into the binoculars, and you get a better view of the object you're sighting. So if you just take, you know, two objects you can see off the chart, and you, using, you know, the, the compass rows, follow those magnetic lines to a point, the interception is where you are. A lot of times you can double-check that if you have a working depth sounder, by comparing your depth to whatever you see on the chart. And you should agree after you correct for uh, the tide. Um, so anyway, I, I can't stress enough the importance of always having a paper backup and some means of navigating. We also, we were down in Belize and we had both a handheld uh, marine navigation uh, GPS chart plotter and the ship's chart plotter. And um, neither one of them really agreed with where the obstacles were. They agreed on the general layout of the land masses and everything. But when you got to actually, what do I need to know when I anchor, um, you know, they disagreed. And furthermore, neither one of them seemed to agree with what we were seeing with our own eyes. Um, and this may be sort of inevitable. Belize is the second largest coral reef in the world. That's a beautiful area to sail in. And the land masses are really just sandbars. Um, and so they get moved around when there's big storms that sweep through there. And um, so, you know, it's, it's probably not possible to have an up-to-date chart all the time. Um, but again, the GPS was actually a distraction. It was better to just shut the thing off and use our eyes and the paper chart as a reference and put people on the bow to look for rocks. And the air is, or the 
water is so clear there you can you can see the coral ways off and so that's how we did it and it worked fine but again as much as I like, like chart plotters they have their limits now I'm not in a position to um, do long ocean passages but if I were to do that now I would definitely bring along charts and a means to navigate um, and the reason for that is that it's inevitable that sooner or later some global conflict is going to break out. Um, so imagine the U.S. and China getting into a squabble over Taiwan. Your GPS coverage is just going to be shut off, just like that. And I've actually experienced this flying. Um, some years ago I was flying my glider in the eastern Sierras, and all of a sudden the, the, sh the main GPS started acting really funny. And so I, I power cycled it, rebooted it, and it was still acting weird. And so then I got, I had a handheld backup that I got out of the pocket and turned it on, and it wasn't working right either. So um, anyway, I, I had charts, and I had learned to fly long before GPSs, so I didn't have any trouble getting home. But it was, it was unnerving. And what I found out was the military was practicing uh, jamming GPSs at that, you know, on that day. And believe me, this GPS jamming does work. Uh, your GPS just acts totally screwy. And so you can imagine that any time any significant conflict um, broke out, that you're just going to lose GPS coverage, and you don't know when you're going to get it back. Um, and so if you're in the middle of the ocean, that's a big deal. Um, so, yeah, I've been experimenting um, just using this plastic uh, Davis sextant, which I'm actually pretty impressed with. Uh, Davis is a company here in the Bay Area in Hayward. Um, and so I've been practicing over the last couple months uh, just seeing how good I could get doing sun sights. And frankly, it takes some practice. It, it's, it's not something you can pick up in a day. And so, you know, after a couple of months of practicing on and off, I've gotten to the point where, first of all, I can do the calculations real quick. And they're all addition and subtraction, so it, it's not like you have to be a math whiz, but you do have to know the sequence, and you have to have the, na the nautical almanac and the um, site reduction tables for the range of latitudes you're going to be sailing in. But I've gotten to the point where I'm um, consistently within about plus or minus three miles of the location. Um, a friend of mine using the same compass has gotten to the point where he's within plus or minus two miles. Um, I think with a, a really good uh, metal uh, sextant, you can probably get under a mile. But, you know, even plus or minus three miles, I'm not going to miss Hawaii if I'm three miles off one way or the other. I mean, I can see a big rock. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm already good enough that, you know, I'd feel comfortable that if, you know, something bad happened and GPS coverage was shut off, you know, I could get to where I needed to go. Um, and I'd really encourage everybody, um, it's actually a lot of fun to learn how to use a sextant. Uh, this was only about $180. It wasn't a huge investment. And um, it also gets you in touch with how people used to do things, which is pretty darn interesting. If you read some of the older cruising books, you, just how impressive some of the, the feats of navigation they accomplished were, you'll you're really appreciate it after you've tried to do it yourself. Okay, that's the end of this video. Um, as always, I, I enjoy the, the comments and suggestions I get. Um, so feel free to leave them and, and uh, have fun sailing. Mm -hmm.